Hello everyone, my name is Jonathan Van Maren, and today we're going to be talking with Dale Alquist about what G.K. Chesterton would say about everything that's going on right now, about the riots, about America, and about a new dark age looming just ahead. That's coming right up, stay with us. My name is Jonathan Van Maren, and welcome back to the Van Maren Show on LifeSiteNews.com. Today we're going to be talking with American author Dale Alquist. Some of you might recognize his name, as we've had him on the show before. He is the president and co-founder of the American Chesterton Society and the publisher of its magazine, Gilbert. He's also the co-founder of the Chesterton Academy, a school in Minneapolis. He joins me to talk about what's going on in America right now, what Chesterton might think about it, what he sees happening in the future, and what comes next. Before we get right into the show, I just want to remind everybody that the news service of LifeSite News, which covers essential pro-life and pro-family news, is one that does rely on supporters. They are in the midst of their summer campaign right now, and if you head to lifesitenews.com slash Frontlines 2020, you can help this mission continue. A generous family has offered to double every monthly gift, and so you can double your impact as well as support podcast news like this. Thanks so much for your support. Here is my conversation with Dale Alquist. Well, first I'm going to ask you, because I know you're quite near to uh, the epicenter of where all of this chaos has been taking place, can you describe what the last couple of weeks have been like for you? Well, it was surreal, to say the least. Uh, it was strange, first of all, to have uh, the whole world glaring at Minneapolis. Uh, and we're, we're not used to having that much attention. And, of course, we, we certainly have been a pretty quiet place. We don't have a lot of uh, problems like this. But uh, this one exploded big time, and uh, it was... Uh, unbelievable to see the destruction to our, our city, to, to watch it in flames, uh, to, to see uh, the, the rage and the, uh, you, you know, the, the anger that just filled the air. But uh, at the same time, you know, you just got a little bit away from that and the rest of the city is quiet. I mean, the, the suburbs were quiet. It was just a very peaceful place like it usually is. But you know, the city itself, right in the, in the inside, in both the Twin Cities, Minneapolis and St. Paul, they were, they were literally on fire. Uh, I talked to people who live 20 miles away who could see the glow in the sky from the, from the fires. Wow. Uh, just just uh, uh, apocalyptic, right? Uh, but then, uh, you know, in the immediate aftermath, I, I went and visited the site uh, where... Uh, you know, that has become the, the new, uh, newest religious shrine, uh, right where George Floyd died. And, uh, and there, uh, I would have to say, most people were very respectful. And uh, there's sort of this truly a sacred quality to, uh, to that spot. People, people are not engaged in rhetoric there. And uh, everyone was moving very peacefully around there. Uh, where, but just a few blocks away, uh, buildings were in rubble uh, and still smoking. Uh, so there was quite a, a contrast and quite a juxtaposition. Buildings boarded up with uh, pleas, uh, you know, across across the the plywood uh, uh, structure, saying, you know, black owned or uh, a family lives here, and right. and just you know, begging for mercy, don't destroy our property. Um, but uh, you know, it was it was a uh, several days of real tension. Um, and then, of course, things started getting back to normal. But then we, we watched how we truly were the epicenter, how it spread to the whole rest of the world. And we, we of course, were the reference point. Uh, I have to tell you, uh, uh, you know, I, I know we're going to talk about what Chesterton uh, said about this. But one of the first things that struck me uh, was a Chesterton line when, it, when all this happened. Uh, Chesterton says, every city is built over a volcano. Every city is built over a volcano, and uh, that's that was epitomized by what we saw here. Every place where there is uh, this concentrated group of people, they are really in a, a sense of 
of, of tension at all times, and things could blow for one reason or another. Civilization is hard work, and you have to work at it. And as soon as you stop working at it, it comes apart in a hurry. It comes apart in a hurry when rage and uh, impolitic take over. Yeah, that, one of the things I I'd really wanted to ask you, being so near, like near what actually took place, because it's pretty surreal to watch what's going on across the United States. And obviously, I am not anywhere close to where I'm a lot closer to to a city burning than I thought I would be at any point in the next decade. And uh, I was born in Seattle, which apparently is host to a, another country entirely at the moment. Um, but one of the things I wanted to ask was, what was it like, like, what did it do to your sense of security, to your identity as an American, to be so close to something and to realize that the veneer of civilization is, is really thin? Because I have found that the pandemic and then the riots, um, sort of happening one after another, and who knows what's going to come next, has really, uh, made a lot of the cliche we, things that we say actually, uh, you know, we actually mean them for the first time, so... Uh, many people always say God willing or the Lord willing in reference to something that they're going to do in the future. Now they actually mean it uh, because they realize, well, most of us are sitting there with, you know, day planners filled with things in pen that we're never going to do. Um, and we say the veneer of civilization is thin, but part of us believes or wants to believe, well, like it, it can't happen here. Like there has to be a series of ro- logical and rational steps before we can get from where we are now to here. And we'll see it coming, you know, before we get to the step where the volcano blows. So what did it feel like as an American as to be so close to what was actually going on? Yeah, it is. It's something we've been talking about for a long time. We've been, uh, you know, Chesterton predicted a new dark ages was coming, uh, a crumbling of our civilization. We were losing our moral base, uh, our religious base, and our cultural base. We were, we've, we've been neglecting the past and all the, the, the lessons of history. And all these things are are, are what hold us together. And, you know, and I've also been, you know, really, really condemning the public education system in this country, which uh, I think is, is our biggest enemy right now. And yet to see the fulfillment of everything we've been talking about, to watch it happening uh, was sobering indeed. We, I, I, I been talking about something like this happening and then it actually starts happening and then you take a breath and say, well, here, here it is. It has come upon us. And at the very same time, Jonathan, there was a sense of serenity and peace because uh, the things of this world are not permanent. And I realized, you know, God is in control ultimately. And we actually have the, the reason for hope. We have the tools to put a civilization back together. Uh, and that was always the assurance I had when I talked about the new dark ages coming, you know, in, in previous years, that, that we have the formula to put things back together. Uh, we have to, to start teaching um, the truth of, of the incarnation and the truth of, of that the built our civilization, the, 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 the truth, beauty, and goodness that is the basis of, of a real education. And uh, even while it was happening, while Minneapolis was on fire, I was, uh, I was running a, a Zoom conference about the Chesterton Schools Network. And, and I had people, you know, from all over the country and in Canada who were listening in and wanting to know how to start a Chesterton school. Even while my city was burning down, I was having that conversation. We're going to shift right into Chesterton here because one of the first things that I wanted to discuss in re- there's, there's actually there's a lot of different threads to be pulling here. But one of the things I've been most interested in um, with Chesterton, besides the subject of our previous conversation, which was was primarily around eugenics, because, of course, I work for, for a pro-life organization. But one of the things I've been consistently interested in uh, in Chesterton's writing is how he talks about the, the relation of the present to the past and that the relation of of now to to our past to our ancestors and that's a, a particularly relevant subject now because we see well i'm sure you saw that like it was so strange to see the images of winston churchill boarded up in london uh because of a potential vandalism by antifa 
folks, right? The guy who defeated fascism is now under threat uh, from these people who really have no idea who he was. So you see, you see these statues coming down, and yeah, there's statues of some bad people coming down, and there's also statues of of people who are flawed, which is all of us uh, coming down. And I want to read you one quote here from Chesterton that I included in an article on actually uh, when when the Wokelings came after a Dutch hero of mine, as you can tell from my last name, I have Dutch heritage, and they were trying to accuse a great Dutch admiral of having been involved in the slave trade, which is uh, both untrue and neither here nor there. But here's one of my favorite quotations from Chesterton, which I, I'd like you to kind of comment on in the present context. The modern mind is forced towards the future by a certain sense of fatigue, not unmixed with terror, with which it regards the past. It is propelled towards the coming time. It is, in the exact words of the popular phrase, knocked into the middle of next week. And the goad which drives it on thus eagerly is not an affectation for futurity. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I think he made the word up. Futurity does not exist because it is still future. Rather, it is a fear of the past, a fear not merely of the evil in the past, but of the good in the past also. The brain breaks down under the unbearable virtue of mankind. There have been so many flaming faiths that we cannot hold, so many harsh heroisms that we cannot imitate, so many great efforts of monumental building or of military glory which seemed to us at once sublime and pathetic. The future is a refuge from the fierce competition of our forefathers. The older generation, not the younger, is knocking at our door. The future is a blank wall on which every man can write his own name as large as he likes. The past, I find already covered with illegible scribbles such as Plato, Isaiah, Shakespeare, Michelangelo, Napoleon. I can make the future as narrow as myself. The past is obliged to be as broad and turbulent as humanity. And the upshot of this modern attitude is really this, that men invent new ideals because they dare not attempt old ideals. They look forward with enthusiasm because they are afraid to look back. Well, this is a, that, that's a great, a great passage from Chesterton, and it ties right in with, with his whole philosophy. Um, and, and it really connects to, of course, what's going on right now. Um, he he really made fun of the futurists during his time, uh, and as you as you recall, you know this is H. G. Wells and his uh, utopias and uh, uh, all these these really blissful pictures of the future. But then then at the same time, we were starting to get these this dystopian literature as well. Um, even though people believed in the sense of endless progress, and and progress uh, became a noun that didn't have any meaning to it anymore. You can't have progress unless you define what it is you're progressing towards. And Chesterton pointed out that those who call themselves progressive never talk about what the goal is. They just talk about progress for progress's sake. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and Chesterton had, had a good time, uh, you know, uh, satirizing that, that point of view that, just believes everything's going to get better and um and the future is is where everything is is going to be just fine and therefore the past is bad the new is good the past is bad uh the newer is even better than than the new and and even newer is better and it's all these fashions that completely fade quickly and no one has any sense of the per of the permanent because they've lost complete connection with with the past and with history uh, this sense of progressivism, Chesterton points out, is tied directly to Darwinism, and right. the sense that um, you know we are as as hu human beings in a, in a progression of getting better. Uh, Nietzsche took that idea that uh, we have to move beyond good and evil. We have to the Superman is next. We have to evolve into the Superman, and uh, that was one of the most poisonous philosophies to ever infect the 20th century. Uh, Nazism was built on that very concept that we are the master race. It's directly connected to Darwinism, but it's also connected to, um, you know, this notion of progress in general and, uh, uh, and futurism. And so it, it's all tied together. Chesterton showed uh, the weakness of the philosophy, but, but how it, it, it kind of infected everything. Uh, the the hatred of the past, uh, Justin points out, is is um, you know completely a a modern phenomenon. He's, you know the modern world is the only 
time in history where people have bragged about being modern, bragged about being here rather than there. And, uh, and so there's no basis to it. There's no foundation to it. And what do we see? What, what are these anarchists doing? They're destroying all traces of the past. They're destroying their own civilization in, in a complete and utter hatred of the past and no understanding at all of what, uh, what history has been teaching us, you know, all along. So, uh, uh, Chester says, you know, we are really living in an, an, uh, an abandoned ruin right now. Well, it's interesting because I think there's room for reasonable discussion on um, placing the past in context, ensuring, not revising history, I would say, in ensuring that history is more fully told, that more perspectives are added to history. That's obviously, con- uh, we, we, we need to do that just for the sake of truth and for the sake of accuracy. In terms even of, of certain uh, certain statues of certain people, I'm sure you've spent time in the former Eastern Bloc, just as I have. There's a, a great park in Budapest filled with these enormous statues of various communist figures. There's actually a, a similar forest near Mon- Moscow that I went in, I went to a couple of years ago with with Lenin heads that are you know bigger than you and I put together, and so there's a discussion about what the context for some of these statues should be. Um, you know, considering the current debate, even Robert E. Lee actually said that he disapproved of of monuments that intentionally sow division. But those are discussions when you have people pulling things down, spray painting them, trashing them, and the thing that strikes me is that you actually have experts going online and telling people how to more thoroughly damage them. Right, you had a uh, you had a, a museum curate in, in in the UK say, "Hey, if you want to destroy statues, here are the best house cleaning uh, solutions to use to to destroy these statues." You had that uh, Egyptologist in the US explaining how best to pull down an obelisk. Um, I didn't really understand the connection of the obelisk to uh, to the current debate. If unless we're going to be t- unless we're still angry about the Exodus or something like that, that seemed a little bit far off to me. But the difficulty is we can't actually have a discussion about history, and I'm tempted to think that Chesterton is right because a discussion of history would bring nuance right there. Like just to bring up the civil war discussion for a moment, there were people on the union side fighting for the wrong reason. There were racists in blue and good men in gray. You know, things are very messy, very complicated because as Solzhenitsyn said, the line between good and evil runs through every human heart. What would Chesterton say in your mind? And based on your exhaustive research, I see the books behind you uh, for the viewers uh, on the top left. There is Chesterton's complete work stretching all the way across the bookcase. Um, what would he say to the, the, the total destruction of these statues? And what does it say about us? Because we're seeing, next we're going to see Washington, Jefferson. And and my suspicion is that if you look at, at the cause celeb today, which is transgenderism, everybody was a transphobe until about 15 minutes ago, which means we're never going to be done pulling the statues down. Um, there's, there's, you're, you're, you're a heretic. Everybody will get to be a heretic for 15 minutes as... To paraphrase Warhol, what do you think Chesterton would say about this this moment? Well, I, I think one of the things he would point out, first of all, to put it into a larger context, Jonathan, is that uh, people are trying to have the discussion through media events right now by by making statements that are simply being broadcast uh, to the world, courtesy of the media, who's filming the statues being torn down, and of course, that's not a discussion. Uh, it'd be, it, you know, to, in order to have a discussion, you actually have to have people sitting around a table or around a fireplace, mm-hmm. uh, and maybe in a, a restaurant that could open up again or a pub open up again. And, uh, and that's where you can start having a discussion with people. Uh, no, no one is talking to each other right now. They're talking to the camera and they're talking past each other. Um, and so, uh, th- I think Chesterton, would uh, first urge us to stop having uh, the discussion through the media, which he didn't, he never trusted because uh, the truth always gets filtered out uh, in, in uh, the, the, in journalism where you are representing not, not the truth, but uh, the opinion of the um, editor who uh, has an agenda when he's publishing his paper. And so uh, and Chesterton knew that firsthand, which is why he had to publish his own paper, uh, right. because he, he knew the truth wasn't getting out um, any other way. But, uh, you know, the, the rage of the mob um, 
it, it can be, uh, th this is, this is not, um, just to point out, this is not spontaneous. It's completely orchestrated. He says a mob isn't necessarily bad. He says a mob is democracy in its purest form. But uh, what we are seeing is not that. What we are seeing is a very uh, vocal and orchestrated minority who are putting on publicity stunts, and they don't represent, uh, you know, the majority of of people. They certainly don't represent common sense. And we just, you know, need a, a moderate tone of common sense to address that complete nonsense. And Chester would try to be that kind of a voice, but that's the voice that we have to be. And uh, what I have found, I don't know if it's been your experience, but, you know, I talk to people on the street. I talk to uh, not only my own colleagues, but to strangers. And, and most people are, are very calm and uh, they're angry about what's going on, but they don't really want any part of that. They don't want any part of that. Uh, and, and, and this is across the, the spectrum, both, both left and right. I've noticed this. They, I mean, there, there are people, there are certain words that are, are hot button words and they may fly off if you say that word, but you can keep the conversation constructive and positive and let's point to some larger truths and that's what no one is doing right now it's they're, they're just reacting to uh, the, the the immediate uh, impulse the immediate uh, thing that is uh, uh, so small and so uh, causing such rage people need to calm down and look at the bigger picture and that's what uh, that's what we need to start doing is get getting people to look at the the bigger picture the problem is sin Jonathan that's the problem sin is what's tearing apart our society well it's interesting because because you'd mentioned too that what we're seeing on the streets looks very much like a new form of religion to a large degree you even have sort of like the liturgical protests and things like that and uh, that there's a quote that actually from Chesterton that, that speaks to that that I used at the beginning of my my article when I was trying to describe the the absence of Christianity in the protests that we no longer have a common set of values to appeal to. And Chesterton said the mob should be the simplest element of humanity because it is the deepest. It is the subconscious of society. That is why it rises so rarely to the surface, and that is why when it does rise, it is as awful as the unveiling of a god. What did Chesterton mean by that? I think uh, there, there was a chance of the mob doing some good in the wake of the tragedy here in Minneapolis, but then the, the mob got subjugated by um, a group of people who did not really care about uh, truth or justice. They cared only about revenge and uh, hatred and uh, they, you know, started to destroy property, and they did not represent. Um, they did not represent the people anymore. That was a, a huge uh, outpouring of orchestrated, completely orchestrated events. We watched the people being bussed in from outside to to go and start uh, burning down buildings. It, it was astonishing to watch. Uh, so this was, not a, this was not the spontaneous movement of a group of people that march peacefully and ask for change um, and, and, you know, ask for governments to be accountable to them. You know, they, but they don't, they don't get the publicity that, uh, you know, how, how long has there been this, uh, this march for life that gets bigger every year in Washington, D.C.? And the media ignores it. They ignore it. Jonathan, the one institution that has done more violence to the black community than any other is Planned Parenthood. Yep. And there is a direct connection between the abortion mentality that will kill babies because there are babies that will kill people because they're inconvenient and will destroy property because they can, because they can destroy property. That's their expression of freedom. And if there's any group that has, has done more disservice to the black community than uh, the, the, the movement that was founded by a eugenicist, as we know, a racist eugenicist, Margaret Sanger, it's, the, it's, it's Planned Parenthood. And no one is getting that message out, except for things like LifeSite News. But we have to teach people that history 
Otherwise, we're never going to make any changes at all. There will be no changes until we can make people understand there's a direct connect connection between racism and abortion. Racism and abortion. Well, and that's sort of the the one of the interesting things about the the statue smashing and the the current iconoclasm is how selective it is. You don't see people demanding that the bust of Margaret Sanger be removed from the Smithsonian. You don't see people going after the eugenicists that were on their sides. You don't even see anybody going after statues of Woodrow Wilson, even though he forcibly resegregated the federal government because he's perceived to be a progressive and therefore his sins are forgiven because he was at least on the right trajectory, so to speak. And it's interesting, I, I, I wish I'd printed the quote out, because I'm, I'm going to butcher it from memory, but, but Hilaire Bloch, one of, uh, one of Chesterton's sometime colleagues, had said too that well, we laugh at the barbarian when he does all these ridiculous things. And a lot of these ideologies we did laugh at at first. Uh, the idea that a man was a woman and a woman was a man just because he or she said so and things like that. Uh, he says, but, uh, but as we degrade ourselves, we are watched by large and solemn faces from the beyond, and on those faces there are no smiles. Sort of, uh, you know, dovetailing right into what Chesterton said about what our ancestors would think of us. We so often, you know, pass judgment on our ancestors and the great women and men of history, despite how flawed they were and despite the fact that they were limited by their times. But we rarely stop to think of what... What would they think of us? How would they judge our generation? We've been without God for two generations as a broader culture, and we don't even know what a man is or a woman is anymore. Yeah, yeah. Chesterton talked about that um, in the. Uh, in it, he'd, he'd read something that was just written, and he goes, "The scholars of the future will read this. They go, and they'll they will say, oh, they only wrote things like that in the early twentieth century, and." Uh, we, are, we are, he said, we are accumulating a great judgment against ourselves uh, in, in, for, by future generations. And that is the great irony of progress, of, of this progressive mentality, is that we are making ourselves look like fools to our children and grandchildren with the, uh, the, the insane uh, behavior, the insane philosophies that are being uh, paraded uh, in front of us. But hopefully there'll be some in the future who say there was this one thread of common sense that was maintained by a group of believers who were actually trying to protect uh, the legacy of the past in order to carry it through the future. Uh, you know, Chester's great line about the, the church in the dark ages, you know, he says that the, the church was the one light in the dark ages that brought us out of the dark ages. And hopefully that is what the future will be able to say about us. But yeah, we, when they look back and, and, and see that we, uh, we, we not only uh, uh, kept kicking our foundations out from under ourselves, we didn't even know what boys and girls were. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I, I know that. So I know that with everything that's gone on in the last couple of years that it's it's dangerous to try and prophesy or predict, but I did want to know what your personal opinion was on how things are unfolding. This is airing on Wednesday, but uh, for those of you um, who might not have heard of this yet, of course the Supreme Court just ruled, uh, and the conservative majority Supreme Court ruled that, uh, that LGBT people now do qualify under the 1964 Civil Rights Act, which is the most devastating blow to religious liberty that we've seen since uh, Obergefell in 2015. Um, the, the rioters seem to have won in terms of nobody dares to question their power. Uh, and they've won because, from what I can tell, an assertion of power is largely what the point was once the protesters got pushed aside and, and the rioters took over. They didn't really have an agenda that they were posing so much as they were flexing their muscles, as we see ongoing in, in Seattle. So before we get to the, the solution for all of this, and what our duty is uh, to be a candle in the dark ages. How do you see us heading into these dark ages and how do you see these dark ages unfolding? Do you have much of a hope that we're going to be able to defend off the forces of secularism and maintain enclaves uh, as small as they might be? Are you a Rod Dre or Benedict option sort of guy or a Wilberforce option sort of guy? What would your take be on, on what the next uh, decade or two uh, is going to be like because it's it's one thing for for people like us to sit and chat about this, but most of us uh, have kids and and everybody's quite worried about the future. What what do you think that's going to look like? Well, um, I think that we are um, a very top heavy uh, civilization right now, top heavy society, and and we are very much in danger of 
of that kind of structure toppling over. Um, but uh, I think that the, you, I, I foresee it, what I'm going to work for, the solution that I'm working for, the future that I'm working for is to uh, take care of my family, take care of my community around me, uh, be true to my faith, and try to give the good news to the rest of the world because I think we have the solution. And I'm, I'm more hopeful than ever because the light is bright when things are dark. Uh, my uh, this this Rod Dreher Benedict option uh, mentality is something that I've actually been working for for a long time before uh, uh, good Mr. Dreher came up with the term. We've we've been trying to establish uh, communities of of believers who educate their children and uh, teach them the truth and teach them what justice looks like and also what truth, beauty, and goodness look like. And I. Uh, I think that the um, the the nonsense philosophies that that are are leading the way right now are simply going to self destruct, and that's what Chesterton says happens to bad philosophies. They they lead first to madness and then to self destructive madness. The LGBT uh, philosophy is is doomed to fail because it simply cannot be maintained. It 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 eats itself and uh, destroys itself. Uh, it, it will inflict pain around it while it happens, but it simply can't be maintained. The public school system is, has been on a steady road uh, to self-destruction, and we are seeing the fruits of public education when we are watching our cities burn down, okay? Uh, I think it, the public education system is in the process of destroying itself. I think these things are going to die a painful death. I think we have to re start rebuilding the civilization even while it is crumbling around us. So what does that crumbling look like? Not, not, not to prod too hard, but one of the things that I'm interested in, what does that look like practically? So there's us, because knowing, knowing some um, predictive practicalities is helpful in terms of exactly what the Benedict option looks like. And I know that looks different in different places uh, for listeners who are not, are not totally familiar with the Benedict option. It's basically um, building up the walls and, and, and protective communities to weather the dark ages and to ensure that our families uh, remain, remain strong so that that faith and the goodness, truth, and beauty can be promulgated through the rest of the culture, even when it is rubble. When you say pa die a painful death, uh, do you mean painful for everybody? How 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 extensive do you suspect that the, the, the cultural destruction and civilizational destruction might get? Well, um, I I think as we see a growing lawlessness, uh, that's going to that's going to have a ripple effect. People have lost respect for authority, and so uh, normal law is going to be difficult to enforce because. People do not recognize the authority of even um, our our political and uh, uh, you know law enforcement uh, officials. They that they have taken a big hit. Uh, COVID helped that. Uh, the, the the COVID thing was so illegitimate and so uh, falsely restrictive, and people you know part of the reason for the rage here was that it came right on the right into the, the teeth of people just so tired of the restrictions and the nonsense of the restrictions. And, you know, when, when, when worship was being, was deemed non-essential and, uh, but, but liquor stores were essential and casinos were es essential. Um, abortion, cl abortion clinics were essential. Yeah, and abortion clinics. Um, you know, the, the nonsense of, uh, you know, of, of the law right now is, is, going to be uh it, 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 we're going to we're going to see the the repercussions of that when people will not obey stupid laws but then also they won't uh they won't obey basic good laws either so we're going to we're going to see a growing sense of disrespect i think for the law both in terms of anarchy and in uh really focused civil disobedience uh because uh True self-government means you govern yourself, uh, and people will will start to see that you have to have a bottom-up solution. And so, again, that's what that's what the topic is. There's also there's also this um, 
growing dissatisfaction with uh, the country being run by just a few big giant corporations. Right. Uh, and uh, people are starting to realize that why do I have to do every service in my life with that Seattle based organization named after a river in South America? Uh, you know, when, when, when are we going to start doing things locally, taking local control of our lives? And, uh, but in the meantime, that huge structure that has been put in place, that infrastructure to support all the giant corporations, that's going to have a painful breakdown. Uh, and and uh, we're going to see problems, I think, with the supplies of food and of, of just necessary services because um, it, it, it's an infrastructure right now that can't be maintained. And we have, we have uh, get, put so much of our basic needs far away from us rather than fulfilling those needs ourselves. There's going to be a, a painful transition when, to, to make uh, even commerce local again and people fulfilling their, their personal needs of their personal actions. So um, that, those are, those are the, I think uh, there's going to be a painful break with big government and a painful break with big business. So there's people of all denominational backgrounds uh, who listen to this podcast. I myself am reformed. There's evangelicals, Baptists, Catholics, big O Orthodox. What would your be a practical advice be to people who are listening to this and thinking, okay, so if there is another dark age coming, which I think uh, the last couple of years have convinced most people is at least not outside the realm of possibility, if not very likely, uh, what are some solid steps I can do for me and for my family? If I don't have a community, how do I start building one? If I do have a community, how do I help prepare that community? What are some of the practical things that you would say to people in light of the potential coming of, uh, of Chesterton's uh, predicted dark age? Well, the most practical thing that we did, Jonathan, is when we started a school. And uh, taking care of the souls of our children is our number one priority. Uh, and so by creating a, a school of people who believe the same truths and uh, want to make sure that their children are formed in those truths and formed in that lifestyle, which is very moral, but also very virtuous and joyful and, and looking towards God and not towards man for the ultimate uh, meaning, uh, we are making better people. And uh, that, there is immediate fruit that is coming out of uh, creating a, a school of, of believers that really take education under control. I, I said before in, in this broadcast, I think our greatest enemy is the public school system. And I think people of all faiths have to get their kids out of public schools right. because they're destroying the souls of their children uh, and, and those schools are driving a wedge between student and parent by teaching them something completely alternative to what the parents are trying to teach them. And, uh, you, know, that, you know, that's where you get the LGBT nonsense. It's coming out of the public schools, abortion, contraception, homosexuality, all those things. But also this, that they're, they're being taught that their children are beasts. That's what they're being taught. And uh, you have to teach them that they're made in the image of God. That's the most practical thing you can teach them. Uh, so uh, a community has to start looking out for each other. Those are, those are very practical steps. Uh, and, and then that has an immediate good effect on all the people around us. We have a good story to tell. and We need to start telling it. And we need to uh, uh, stop reacting to the bad news. We have to start telling the good news and people have to start reacting to us. Right. I guess uh, a final sort of Chesterton question. Uh, one of, one of uh, his most interesting books is, is, is uh, when he went to America, his big, fat, leather-bound book on America. What do you think that, just to give a plug uh, for that particular book, what do you think in that book, Chesterton's observations when he came to the U.S., and he was so outside of political correctness, I think it's one of the only video film strips of him still, where he gave a commencement speech, and he said uh, that um, although, um, although he was not, not an American, at least he was not a Mohammedan, which would... Which wouldn't? Yeah, no, he said it was at Holy Cross College. It was just a, it's a, it's a film, film clip, 
uh, where he was made an honorary crusader because Holy Cross, uh, you know, they, they were called the Crusaders. Yes, uh, yes, yes. And, and uh, it's, it's uh, a college founded by the same uh, religious order that founded Notre Dame in Indiana. And, and he said, well, thank you for making me a, a crusader. I don't know that I am a crusader, but I'm certainly not a Mohammedan. <laughs> <laughs> you, can't, you can't be more politically incorrect than that. Yeah. But, uh, but in his book, What I Saw in America, I mean, he, he says that um, slavery, he believed that slavery is the crime and catastrophe of American history. He, he called it the crime and catastrophe of American history. And that uh, he couldn't believe, he was astonished when he came to America, the, the land of the free, and found that people hated each other on the basis of race. He, he was so surprised to discover that. He didn't think that. And he, he, he said, you know, it's true that in history, white men have behaved like white devils to black men. And it's, it's, but it's certainly the original sin uh, of American history. And, uh, and, and he saw America was paying a heavy price for it. But by the same token, he was such a great admirer of of the Declaration of Independence as one of the great documents for freedom. And, it, and the, that creed, he says, America is the only nation founded on a creed. It sets out what, what it believes in its formation. And we believe that, you know, all men are created equal and, and they're given their rights by their creator. And uh, he points out that there is this brotherhood of men. It's certain, there's certainly a hypocrisy in America that didn't recognize the blacks, uh, you know, were given should be given the same rights, but by the same token, it did understand that our rights come from God. They they come from God, and you can only have human rights if you recognize them as divine rights. Uh, and, and and so he 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 admired and, and praised that uh, in, in his observations of American. He he found the American people uh, just very enjoyable. He says it's the the typical American is all right. It's the ideal American that's all wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Which would, yeah, that quote, I think, summarizes the whole conversation we've just had over the past 45 minutes. Final question, where can uh, our listeners and our viewers find your work and, and, and become more acquainted with Chesterton? Yeah, please visit Chesterton.org and also uh, the Chesterton Schools Network.org to learn more about the Chesterton Academies. Uh, this is the, one of the most positive things that's happening in the world right now is the growth of these Chesterton schools around the country. And one other organization uh, that, that we're affiliated with, uh, Jonathan, Teach for Christ, teachforchrist.org. Uh, we're sending out college students to, to serve in, in schools and uh, you know, help, help form uh, the students out there in, in today's uh, hor- horrible dark world right now. Well, Dill, thank you so much for taking uh, uh, time again to uh, discuss Chesterton with us and what he has to tell us about today. Anytime, Jonathan. Happy to be with you. Ladies and gentlemen, that was my conversation with Dale Alquist on how he sees the future unfolding and what Chesterton would have had to say about all of this. If you enjoyed this show, please do like and subscribe on YouTube. You can check us out on every platform where you do get your podcasts. You can head over to LifeSiteNews.com to check out the podcast as well as a wide range of life and family news. Thank you once again so much for joining us this week, and we do hope that you'll join us again next week.